we're now going to look at the how will the best the science the science of the SKA project will being done and what implications are there for the global scientific enterprise? I mean, what, what, what lessons can, can we learn from the SKA project? So our next speaker is um, Professor uh, Antonio Crisitomo, who's the head of operations at the uh, SKA uh, organization. And, and we often speak in science policy about distributed science, network science, distributed research infrastructure. So Antonio is, is going to uh, give us an insight into how the SKA uh, is really changing the paradigm of distributed science. Antonio, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. So, uh, yeah, so what I'll be talking about today is um, how, how the fact that we have to operate in a globally distributed way um, is really going to be establishing a new paradigm for not just um, uh, science, but, you know, the, the astronomy as a whole and science and how we, we uh, and I'm going to be explaining uh, how we, how this has come about. Um, throughout, I'm going to be putting, I won't be talking specifically uh, directly about the uh, sustainable development goals, but I will be putting these little postage stamps throughout to indicate where, where I think uh, we, um, we, we, uh, we, we touch on those. So the whole uh, model for the, uh, for the SKA is that we, we, we're trying to follow this one observatory model while recognizing that we'll be operating two telescopes on, on, on three different sites. So we'll be operating the SK-1 low telescope uh, in uh, Australia uh, and the mid telescope in South Africa, as we've heard already, with the global headquarters in, in the UK. And at each of these sites, there are facilities present which uh, will enable and support the operation of the observatories as a whole. So at the, at the observatory level, our district operations here are, are global, as you can see. We've already talked about the, the membership, 15, currently 15 members, and uh, a host of uh, African partner countries you can see in the pink there. And the three main sites I was talking about, the one in, uh, in, uh, in the UK, one in uh, South Africa and, and Western Australia. And so, you know, globally, we have this distributed operational challenge that we have to try and solve. But this breaks down into smaller uh, portions as well. So in Australia, you see that the, in, in Western Australia, the capital there, Perth, is where our science operations and science processing centers will be. But the telescopes are some 800 kilometers away in, in, the, uh, in the Murchison uh, area of the, uh, of, of the outback of Western Australia. The engineering operations center is some 400, 600 kilometers up the coast in Geraldton there. So you can see again, we're having to support and operate the telescope. And I should say, should have said that the control of the observatory, the control of the telescopes will be from the science operations centers, uh, in this case in, in Perth. So we have these, all these antennas and these uh, arranged into 512 stations distributed across six, 65 kilometers at the telescope, but controlled from over 800 and supported by three, three 400 miles uh, kilometers away. Similarly, in, uh, in South Africa, at the, again, at the telescope level, you see maybe a, a better appreciation of how the uh, distributed operations breaks down in these, in these different uh, scales. So the telescope in the, in the Karoo area of, of uh, Northwestern Cape, South Africa, uh, over 150 kilometers uh, in, in the, the largest baselines that we will have. The engineering operations center is much closer, maybe 80 kilometers actually from the array center. But again, the science operations and processing centers will be in Cape Town and it's from there that we will, we will operate and control the telescopes. So we have this globally distributed operations where we have uh, on a, just not on a, on a global scale, but also on a more local level uh, within the countries themselves. And then as you go down into the telescope level, uh, the actual arrays themselves are distributed over, over hundreds of uh, tens and hundreds of kilometers. So operationally, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge for us. But maybe, um, Really, the, the impact that we will have to our uh, environment, the SKA's environmental impact, is largely going to be determined by how much power we use to, to run this observatory and from where we source this power. 
So currently uh, in Australia, there is um, a, uh, an existing 1.85 megawatt PV solar panel farm, which is helping to power the ASCAP and MWA telescopes. Uh, and it, it uses, it has a two and a half megawatt hour battery, which at the time that it was installed was, was the largest battery in Australia. That's, that's since been taken over by, by uh, Elon Musk's new battery there. For the SKA, clearly we want to, to build on this and uh, we need to think about greener ways and more sustainable ways that we can power uh, our, our observatories and we will need something of the order of five megawatts to do this. Um, and so we, we are looking at a significant inspe inspe expansion, uh, which we're investigating for, for the SKA and we will do this for both of our telescope sites. Phil showed this diagram earlier, but I think it's worth uh, going, going over. It shows the data flow that goes through the, the SKA. And this is one of our, is another one of our great operational challenges, which is I've which been talking about. I'm just kind of, kind of uh, bring it down to just three small diagrams here. So managing the data flow, the flow of data through the, through the system. We have scale and we have versatility, we have complexity. And which is le which is what leads to this large data array that emerges from our our, our telescopes. So you see, uh, for for the two telescopes, we get of the order of uh, nine five to nine uh, terabits per second coming out of uh, the dishes. And actually, if we went to an even lower level uh, and we looked at the antennas, each individual antennas, the data rate from each individual antenna, that sort of would be of the order of two petabits per second. This data is then fed and transported to the central signal processor. Now in our current in the design, the, uh, there's these computers, uh, which again, supercomputers really, are located at the telescope sites. And they take that incoming data and they, they do the first initial computations and then transfer it the 600 kilometers or so distance from there to the science processing centers where our science data processing is housed. So that travels at a, the rate that we, that, that comes into the science data process is about five terabits per second. Now we have to keep in mind also that there is real time calibration happening between these two sites. So the data is fed from the central signal processor to the science data processor where some initial calculations are made, some real time calibration and that information is sent back to the, to the uh, central signal processor to do, to do the real-time calibration on the data, on the beamforming and, and so forth, especially. And then the science data processor then takes that raw data and tries to compress it even further. So you see we're stepping down in the data rate and the volume as we go through this, uh, this, this chain, this sequence, so that the data that we deliver to the community is at a, is a relatively smaller rate. hundred. We're trying to fill a hundred gigabit per second data links that we will we anticipate having coming out of the the observatories. Now, if we were to fill those uh, data links, we would be able we would be generating up the order of three hundred petabytes per year from each of the two telescopes, and the kind of processing power that we envision we need to be able to do that to be able to step down from the terabits to the gigabit uh, data rate. It's about 130 petaflops uh, for each of our science data process machines. So managing this data flow, as I said, is one of our greatest operational challenges. This data rate of, you know, it's, it's equivalent to, to, to about a, what filling one laptop every second uh, that comes out of the correlator that goes into the, uh, the science data processor. And if we were to convert that to, to kind of the raw data, that's equivalent to something between 45 to 85 petabytes of raw data per day per telescope. So clearly this is not a feasible way to uh, deliver data to our community. And if you do just a simple back of the envelope cal calculation, it is actually cheaper to just, re if something goes wrong, to just reobserve the data again than it is uh, with all the kind of assumed costs that that entails. It's cheaper to reobserve the data than just to store the data and hold it um, to, to investigate what, what, what may be a problem with the, uh, with the data. So it's really a, an unfeasible way of uh, storing the data, but it is how traditionally astronomy has um, 
proceeded. You've gone to your telescope, you've collected your raw data, you've put it onto a table, put it into an enclave somewhere. You've uh, gone back to your home institute and downloaded the data and processed the data onto your, onto your laptop. That is just not feasible with the SKA. So the data then needs to be uh, delivered uh, around the globe because we won't, we, the SK will not be able to have the, the capacity within the observatory to continue to process the data. It has now passed into the science uh, SK regional, uh, regional centers around the globe. You'll see the data, the, the, this image here shows the, the major um, network paths that are relevant to the SKA. You can see that they emerge from South Africa and uh, Western Australia and enter the, the, the faster networks in the Northern Hemisphere. Essentially, here they are entering the, uh, the SK Regional Center ecosystem. And it's from there that our community will be able to access the data, uh, process the data and do the science that they need. So the three main factors then that have led us to this uh, idea that we, we require the SK regional centers are, are, are listed here. Firstly, is that the observatory data products that emerge from the science data processor are gonna need further work. They are not the final product. They all need to be visualized. So you can actually understand and get a, a, a feel for what the data look like. You'll need to perform scientific analysis on the data and model it before you publish the data. As I said earlier, the data volumes themselves are so large that direct delivery to end users is just not feasible. We're gonna to need to have a system where, where users can, can go to a, a, a landing page, log on to their project and see where the data is and allow all the computing that goes on in the background in the high performance computing centers that we will need to arrange the data for you and to deliver it to you and to process the data for you. And finally, but certainly not something that we want to disregard, in fact, it's very important for us, is that our community of scientists that work on SK science data will be geographically distributed across the globe. And so we will need some uh, ecosystem that will allow and promote collaborative science to be, uh, to be done. And that's what we envisage the, the SRCs delivering as well. So it's a place where you can not only just access your data, it's somewhere that you can go and uh, actually work on your data as well. And so process the data, but it's also a place where you and your collaborators can get together and it'll be a, become a collaborative platform to do science as well. So that's what this uh, network will provide. And in the diagram here, you see basically everything that comes out of the observatory in the left-hand box uh, gets delivered into a series of uh, regional centers across the globe. And it's only from here that our users will be able to access uh, the data and, uh, and analyze it. We'll, have, we'll be able to provide user support uh, as well as the advanced analysis um, and also importantly archive use uh, to be able to have a, a good archive of your data and have that publicly available is, is really very, very important for the SKA. So it's a platform for collaborative science, it provides access to data, a transparent and location agnostic interface for users. Really what I'm saying is that when you go to uh, to your to your regional center and you log into your to your to the system and you try and access your data you should not care where your data is and in what data center it is everyone who uses dropbox or google or whatever you know when you when you go to access your dropbox file you don't ask yourself now i wonder what data center this document is actually sitting in or before i download it you, you don't really care and you should not care where your data is it should be a transparent and location agnostic um, interface all you should care about really is that you have access to the data and you're able to do something with it and, 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 the, and the ecosystem that we're trying to develop in the background is to provide that. So finally, I'm going to leave with this uh, four pillars, if you like, of what we, uh, in, in what we require the, these regional centers to provide. It's important for the observatory as well because it allows us to maintain the flow of data out of the observatory to the SK, SK community. But also in doing so allows us to continue with the science program. If we were not, if we had to 
do all the things that the SK regional centers will do, it would really impact, it would create a huge backlog in the science data process or the computing power would not be available for us. But because we have to maintain a data flow and, and, and you've seen the rate of data that comes out of the telescopes, we would we would we were able to continue to do that and provide a a, a, a long a long uh, science program which which continues to produce you know 70 80 90 percent of the time so it was always available for science it provides compute resources to allow these users to combine and analyze their data and to create science and new knowledge the data storage and tools to enable a science archive to allow discovery science and it's been known since HST or even before that really that having an efficient and, and useful science archive is really is a multiplier of science and, and, and scientific knowledge. And of course, um, because these are regional centers, they're also a good way for these regions to invest in their local communities and to provide uh, the support that reg local, local regional uh, scientists will need in preparing and analyzing their uh, SK science and data. So thank you, Dan. That's, that's my presentation and uh, thank you for your attention.